welcome to the Dose Show, everybody. Happy Thursday already. Sneaking by on us this week is. I uh, hope you're having a great day so far. Uh, if you're watching us for the first time, we're financial advisors with Jazz Wealth Managers. We do the Dose Show here just to help you kind of, you know, learn about your dough, help you get your dough straight. Sort of a fun way to say, look, it doesn't have to be boring learning about finance, investing, retirement, personal finance. Uh, and so we just try to walk you through it with really short videos. If we happen to help you in some way, hit the subscribe button. Really appreciate it. Today we're going to talk about uh, some fallacies in a 401k, meaning uh, things that people tell me about their 401ks and I kind of go, eh, you know, maybe if you just did it this way, maybe not such a big deal. So if you have a 401k uh, and you're sort of wondering some things here, uh, then we'll, maybe we'll cover that topic. If you have a question below, feel free to answer or put it in the comments there if you're watching live. Otherwise, leave a comment there and uh, I'll try to answer your question for you. Um, one of the things we do for our customers, by the way, is we review their entire 401k. So we make sure it's invested correctly. We'll stay on top of it with you as the funds change. We'll change if we need to. Uh, just one of the things we offer by working here with us at Jazz Wealth. Well, the first thing that I uh, get a lot is that, hey, uh, it's cool if I take a loan from my 401k, right? And I'm sort of neutral on this one, which maybe is odd because most financial advisors would say, absolutely not. You do not take a loan from your 401k. I'm sort of like flexible with the times here, right? If times are really good, everybody's got a job, everything's going really well, and you don't have your dough straight and you have to take loan because of some sort of hardship, uh, I don't like that. I don't like the idea of you taking loans for uh, the uh, to buy real estate, to buy a car, to do things like that. I get the interest rate game that some of you are trying to play. I just don't like it because one of the sort of problems that people run across, is, and I'll draw it out here for you. So if you have a 401k and you take a loan from it, right? You borrow some set amount of money, let's call it $10,000, whatever it is. The max is 50,000 in a year, but let's say you take out 10,000. Then you say, well, I'm gonna make payments. And I get it, I'm paying this loan back to myself. Did you know that, by the way? If you take $10,000 out, they may say, well, you're gonna pay back 3% interest. And you go, well, that's incredible, only 3%. You actually pay that back to yourself. When you take the loan out, they usually charge you like 150, uh, I don't know, maybe $200 for some kind of fee. It depends on where it's at. That you pay to the company for the process of doing it. But this 3% you pay back to yourself in the 401k. So it's like you're earning 3% off money that you're repaying yourself and people go, that's a great deal. Okay, right, if you have to do it, you have to do it. I mean, each circumstance is sort of unique, so it's hard to make a video and speak generally to everybody and say, you do not do something or you can do something. It really depends on the individual, but here's the problem. As you make payments, let's say you're making, um, I don't know, $200 a month payments back towards your 401k, Let's say you decide to leave your job. Let's say you get fired. For whatever reason, you find a better job. You get sick. You, for whatever reason, you stop working at this company and you were putting $200 a month in. Well, the, the company's gonna say, that's cool. You just keep paying the $200 a month and we'll be good. We won't bother you, no problem. Even though you've left, you could still make payments. Some companies make you pay it when you leave. So let's say you paid off 5,000 of the loan and then you left your job. Some companies are gonna say, pay us the 5,000 or we are going to count that as a distribution in which case you'll owe taxes and penalties, of course. So uh, some companies will let you continue to pay. Almost nobody that I've talked to continues to pay. I even try to get them to do that and just say, don't move any money, just make the payment. When you don't pay back that loan, well, now the amount gets counted as a distribution. Well, if you take a distribution early from your 401k, you have to pay a 10% penalty. So it doesn't matter how much you paid yourself back uh, for the percentage wise, you have a 10% penalty. And now the amount that you took out counts as income which I don't know where your tax bracket is, but that could be say 22%, 2018, you know, middle of the road tax bracket. And so just think of it right off the top, you lost 30% for that loan. That's $3,000 that you potentially could be getting hit there. So when people say, I can take a loan for my 401k, it's all good, I'm gonna pay it back, that may be the case. But if you don't know that that is one of the biggest sort of IRS little sneaky fees that they get, 
uh, because a lot of people just think it's no big deal. Oh, I just won't pay it back. I'll just add it to my taxes. I bought a house anyway, so I'll get some sort of tax deduction. Really? <laughs> so be careful there when you do that one. It's not a um, it's not a hard fast rule for me that you can't do it, but you should really understand what you're in for uh, when you do that. Okay. The next thing that I get a lot is um, I will roll over my 401k to a Roth. Almost daily, people call me or open an account and they say, I would like to take my old 401k and move it into a Roth IRA. And I'm not saying a Roth 401k. They say, I want my 401k to go to a Roth, Dustin. I love the idea of getting me some Roth IRA. Post-tax money is where I want to be. I hated that this was all pre-tax money. Um, we can do this, right? But the first thing you're going to do is put it in an IRA first. Or at least if you're working with me, this is what we're going to do. I'm not going to let you, and hopefully many people don't let you, move from a 401k to a Roth because if you do, the entire amount becomes taxable. There's no penalty or anything, but the entire amount gets converted to a Roth and the government wants their money. You've been putting money and your employer's been putting money in here tax deferred. And they say, okay, fine, if you're gonna move it to a vehicle where you don't owe taxes, just give us our tax money and we'll let you do that. So what I'm gonna tell people is, you can do this, but first go to an IRA. Let's talk about it, right? <laughs> let's try not to pay the taxes right away. Let's, little breathing period, let's have some conversations, you know, and then see if it's really still a good deal for you. I want you to wait to do this conversion from the 401k to the Roth or sort of the little sidestep there when the market is lower. I don't mean market's lower now. I mean when the market is low, when people are panicking, when you have uh, investments that have lost 20, 30% and everybody's like, oh my God, the world's gonna end. That's when you make the conversion, okay? Sounds weird, but that's when you do it. That's one of the times that you do it. You can do it when your income is lower. Let's say your income is down for the year because you took a sales job rather than a, a sort of a, a normal standard salary job, or let's say you started a business and it's gonna take some time for that business to get rolling. Maybe that's the reason you left your job and wanna roll it to a Roth, okay that's when you do it, when your income's lower. You decide, you and your spouse, you had a baby and one of you stayed home for the year for the first year because it was cheaper than daycare and all that garbage. And so that's the time you do it. That's why we're moving it to an IRA. If you have an old 401k, we'll help you roll it over to an IRA, but we may stop there, right? We may say, just wait. Didn't you say you're going on vacation two years from now to sail a boat around the world or something? You did? Okay, great. I will set alerts for you. I'll pick on you in that year to call you from a satellite phone on your sailboat so then you can start moving money to a Roth because maybe it makes more sense then. Okay, the final time is when you retire. There's no hurry, guys. When you roll over a 401k, people think that somehow it's frozen in time and it won't grow. A lot of our customers have both an IRA, which accepts their rollovers, and let's say we invest it in our aggressive mix, right? And we've got, that's, that's what's going on in there. It's our mix of aggressive stocks. All our portfolios are on our website. Then they say, I'd like to contribute in a post-tax way. I really want that Roth, Dustin. That's what I want. We say, okay, well then you can also have the Roth. You will have two accounts, but both of them will be invested the same exact way. Then what happens when the market falls, let's say the value of this loses, I don't know how the markets fall. One day they're gonna fall 20, 30% or something. If it was $10,000 and it's worth seven now, can you imagine how much tax savings? That's $3,000 less in taxable income you have to report for the year that we could just go ahead and shift it right over. We don't have to change the investments. We can just go push it over here. No problem, right? Meanwhile, your investments stay the same. So you paid tax on a much lower cost basis that's ah, getting geeky. I'll save that one for another time because I, sometimes I get excited and I just go a little off the beaten path there. But think of the tax cost basis by a lower IRA moving into a post-tax IRA versus if you did it earlier this year. The market's at all-time highs. Nobody had a loss. Everybody's profitable. Why would you want to volunteer a higher IRA value uh, to be moved over to a Roth? You wouldn't, right? That's something I would try to talk you out of, so that's that. Okay. Anyways, moving on. I didn't mean to take too much time on this video here today, but hopefully it's helpful with you guys or for you guys. 
Um, I get this one a lot. Doesn't target date funds are bad. I've got my 401k and inside of it, they offer a lot of target date funds. I hate target date funds and I want to choose an index fund because I'm scared of the target date fund. Well, it's maybe partly my fault, all right? So in your 401k, you have a list of investments. If this is, if you're brand new, I'll just do this real quick. You put money in and your employer puts money in. So you got money coming from both sides here and now it's up to you to choose the investments. There's really no help. If you don't choose investments in your 401k, they usually put you in a money market fund, which loses money. It, it doesn't make money. And so you have to choose investments. And a lot of people will say, um, I don't know what to do. So I just picked a few things, right? If you do a little homework, you go, I see the index fund. I see the target date fund. What happens is target date funds sort of are getting a bad reputation lately because they've taken excess risk. Here's exactly how it works. I'm gonna use a different color here. They essentially plot this on a graph. This is your age, right? We'll call this retirement. This is when you actually retire. And this is probably when you die, somewhere in here, okay? And so what target dates funds do is, this is the risk, right, over here. The younger you are, or the further out the target date fund is, let's say it's a 2050 target date fund, it's gonna take a lot of risk and as you near retirement, it's gonna take some less amount of risk and then flatline. And maybe that's the 2050, right? If you're closer to retirement and you have like a 2035, then your risk level is already dropping off, right? Because you're closer to retirement. And to be fair, this would actually start right here. So it's already gonna taper off and flatline. Okay, oh, that's not flat, but you get the idea there. And so that's what these target date funds do. They slowly take less and less risk or they take a more focused risk as you get older. What's been happening is as you get older, this is more of an income approach. Bonds, REITs, dividend, slow dividend stocks, and they would move over to that. Most of it goes to bonds and it's a sort of laddered product, meaning what it does is they just do a whole bunch of different bonds instead of just picking a long-term, short-term, whatever it may be. They sort of basket them all together. Where have interest rates been for like the last seven years? Uh, very low, right? So interest rates are so low that those bond vehicles are not really giving any return, but they promised you that they would generate some sort of return relative to your risk. And so what these target date funds have actually been doing is this. The closer you get to retirement, the more risk they've been taking. That's their sort of model or their projected model for how they're managing your assets. If you're closer to retirement, they've been keeping the risk higher all the way through. They have to, right? Because they weren't getting any money in the interest rates. So they were very stock heavy and that causes excess risk in something that's really not supposed to have that level of risk. Because of that, they did get, some companies got slapped on the wrist a little bit by the regulators to say, hey, we don't care. If the, your model means you're gonna take more risk for something you said you weren't gonna take that much risk for, we're, you're gonna have a problem. And so there have been companies that, you know, I've been talking about the articles of the companies that, you know, been uh, getting in a little bit of trouble. Just know target date funds are not bad. It's just that they've been a little more aggressive than they should have been. And, uh, you know, people are gonna rag on them for that a little bit. That will adjust over time, by the way. So. Uh, no need to worry about that. Okay, next thing, uh, people tell me, I can contribute less because I'm going to be more aggressive. Dustin, I'm going to move my 401k to you and I'm going to contribute just a little bit because I'm gonna ask you to be aggressive and that'll make up the difference. Mm. <laughs> Maybe, right? It depends on what your goal is. So if you come to me and you say, I only wanna contribute a little bit, but I want $100,000 a year in retirement, the answer is no, <laughs> you can't do that. It's not gonna work. I'll tell you nicely and find some sort of clever joke to stick in there so you feel better about it. But the answer is no, you're being ridiculous. You can't do that. You have to contribute in the game as well. The actual, if you look at the numbers of how someone gets to retirement, it's because they contributed heavier in the beginning then eased up as they got older. It's just simple compound interest at that point or basic compound interest, I should say. The actual way you should say it is I am younger, therefore I'm going to contribute less. Because the younger you are, the, the less hard you have to try, right? Because you have so much time for that money to 
compound. So that's one that I hear a lot. People think that they're going to make up time, make up the difference by just being more aggressive. And uh, that creates a very emotional investor. I'll just say that because that's, that's a tough one. All right. Another one that I get is my contribution and my company match to my 401k here and here are set so that I will have enough for retirement. And I go, what is enough? And they go, $1 million. I have, want to have $1 million and the 401k calculator that they have in my little 401k portal says that I will have a million dollars in retirement. Well, that's okay, but I want you to think in terms of income. And that's something that you know that the people that have been watching quite regularly have noticed that I focused on a lot more and now the federal government is focusing on it as well. Remember when you, uh, the government said, hey, credit card companies, you now have to tell people if they make only the minimum monthly payment on a credit card, uh, you have to show them how much it, they'll pay back and how long it'll take them to pay that back. And the credit card companies fought it. They fought it hard and they lost. So that's on your credit card bill. Now the federal government is saying, hey, 401k companies, we want you to sort of stop that nonsense of telling people that they will have X number of dollars in retirement. And we want you to tell them how much income they will have in retirement as far as what you can take out every month. Some companies have already switched to that and done a great job, but it's going to possibly become a regulation that that actually has to happen. So it's not about the total amount that you want to save up. That means nothing. And people are figuring that out. It's about the income that you want to spend in retirement relative to, you know, your investment dollars. So uh, keep that in mind. Okay. The last one that I get all the time is, um, Hey Dustin, it, the markets have been going up. And I've been putting in my 6%, 10%, whatever, in my 401k. And now I get the idea that the markets are weaker and they may fall. They may crash, right? A lot of people think, for some reason, people think markets go up and crash. Markets go up and crash. That's definitely not the case. But maybe that's a good video. Anyways, I've been getting a lot of questions from people saying, should I make my contribution go back down to zero while the markets are weak? And the first thing I tell customers is, sure, you could do that, but I'm not going to be the one to tell you when the markets have bottomed because nobody knows, right? And so my question to you would be, here is what's happened with the stock market recently. If you go back to October, if you watch the closing beat at five o'clock, you know the markets have been pretty weak here uh, going through October into November. Is that a bottom? If you turned off your contribution to your 401k, let's say here, right? Is it time to turn it back on? That's the tough part. That's the really tough part is to figure out what is the bottom. We had the Fed chairman speak just uh, yesterday. The markets rallied aggressively. In my opinion, that's the bottom for the year. What happened uh, three days ago, that's the bottom of the market for the year. Does that mean you turn your 401k back on? Do you contribute back again? It's just way too hard to do that. And so what I actually did, I'm so sorry, I don't have the link available. Um, I think the title is Worst Investor Ever, but uh, if you search that on our channel, I actually did a video that said, what happens if you bought only at the tip top high of every single market right before it started a downtrend? Would you be okay? And for all of you that want to have a million dollars in retirement, you actually do end up with a million dollars if all you did was buy the exact high of every market top. So trying to time your contributions, um, I'm all for increasing contributions when things fall and you just want to put like 1% more, a couple dollars more or whatever. I'm a big fan of that. You can increase. Don't stop though. Cause that we could prove that even if you're buying the highs, you still end up with enough money. So why not make it all count for you? So, um, you know, that's where I'm at on that one. That's really all I have for you today. Uh, as far as things go there. Uh, it is Thursday. <laughs> you wish someone told me that I wanted my retirement account to generate income. Yes. Well, Hey, the future generations, those of us coming after me will now be able to think of it in those terms. Um, and that's great. You know, that, that really is going to be a great addition. I think, uh, if you turn off your 401k, you may not be able to max for the year to put in more paycheck. That's true, right? You may want to get so many dollars in there. And if you turn it off, it may be too late to turn it back on and get to the max considering how much you're putting your paycheck in there. So another negative for that comment there that uh, I get all the time. You've heard of people with Roth 401ks rolling employee contributions in the Roth and paying the taxes on them. Um, that is going to be plan by plan. 
So it's sort of weird. 401k plans are somewhat individual in nature, meaning they can set up rules ahead of time. It's like a SEP IRA. If you open a SEP IRA and you have like five employees, the employer can determine the rules. So with 401k companies, unless it's like a Fidelity or something, they, Fidelity goes to a company and says, would you like to open a 401k for your employees? Company says, yes. They go, here, we'll just put all the rules in place for you. Don't worry about it. And then the, the employee's like pissed because those rules, their, Fidelity's got some tough rules. So they basically do it for you. If it's a smaller 401k company, they a lot of times will go through with their um, new customer and they'll say, how do you want to handle this? How do you want to handle this? Do you want people to be able to do in-service distributions, meaning roll over while they're still working or not? Most people, they, they will sort of guide them to say no on that one. Um, and that's one of those things. Would you like to be able to have people roll over from a Roth, to uh, their, your contributions into a post-tax um, vehicle and let the actual uh, contributor pay the taxes case by case basis. Yep. The question would be if that's a good thing though. I would go back to the first thing we talked, second thing we talked about today of timing that conversion. If they'll let you do it, the timing on that one. You don't do it just because you can, you can time that. That's probably one of the things I would say you could have fun timing. Uh, if I had to pick something. Anyways, that's all I have for you today. Like we said yesterday, the stock market will be a snoozer for the next two days unless news comes out, and that has proven to be true today. There is not a lot going on, so much so that I was thinking about Disney World all morning today. I was like, maybe I could take the day off. It's kind of cold and like just sneak over there. Would anybody really know? And I tweeted something interesting about um, the dividend in Disney there. Uh, if you had enough shares, you could actually go to Disney World, uh, well, January 11th, uh, for free. So check it out if you're on Twitter there. And uh, we'll be back at five o'clock to do the stock market update, even if it is a quiet day today. I appreciate you guys watching and we will talk to you later. Why should you choose Jazz Wealth as your retirement or long-term investing service? Our portfolios are managed by us, not some faceless mutual fund manager. Our private classes will teach you everything about investing and getting your dough straight. Best of all, our fiduciary standard means your best interests comes before ours.